Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here and very happy to be with such a, a great panel uh, for this discussion. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of, of data that we have on a couple areas that are re relevant to uh, this issue of, of rebel governance. So um, I'm focused mostly on sort of how armed groups are responding to crises. Uh, particularly, we'll be looking at climate change and COVID-19 today. So during times of crisis or emergencies, you know, we know from literature that um, armed groups often try to take advantage of a weakened or distracted state to advance military means, um, to recruit or establish a presence, or sometimes to try to actually govern and enhance their legitimacy um, and credibility with the local populations. So we'll be talking about that in light of these two, uh, probably the biggest crises that we've faced worldwide today. So this comes, I think, as part of a larger project that we're working on that's not specifically on these two issues, where we're trying to understand with this whole group of partners that you see here, uh, how and why people exit armed groups and sustainably reintegrate into civilian life. Um, so we're doing this, you can see on my little map, we're doing this in Colombia, Nigeria, Chad, Niger, Cameroon, and in Iraq. So these are all very different uh, multi-method studies. We've been working with a whole host of academics, some of you might be in this room, um, from neuroscience to political science, from social work to criminology, to really understand how you would measure somebody's sustained reintegration, what that might look like, um, and how you would do it in a way that you create tools that are both universal, but also um, contextually specific. So that's what we've been working on. And in the course of that work, we've come to touch on these two issues and sort of how armed groups and how populations are responding to them. Um, so this just gives you an idea of we're collecting a lot of data. Uh, this was March, um, and you can just see all the different surveys that were happening simultaneously. I'll just tell you very quickly, and this is not the level of detail I should give you about our sample and sampling methods, but I'm happy to explain later. I just I want to get to the results that we, we have emerging. So um, this is based on two studies in Nigeria. One was a, a survey of 275 community leaders across Borno State, and the other one is our midline survey. Um, we do surveys with ex-combatants, formerly associated individuals, and uh, community members who've never been associated as well. The midline survey is predominantly ex-combatants, so that's about 800 people. In Chad, Niger, and Cameroon, we just did this survey in March, that's why you see that huge spike. Um, we have about 1,000 people in Chad, a mix of ex-combatants uh, ex and community members uh, across uh, Lac Province and Hadra Loomis. Uh, in Cameroon, in the north and the far north, we have about 800 people, 52% of them are ex-combatants. And in the Difa region of Niger, we have about 516. Um, over 100 of them are ex-combatants as well. So this represents about 1,600 ex-combatants um, in the various surveys that I'm talking about. Uh, in Colombia, we have not, we have just started in the last month. Um, another reason you see a spike, doing work with people coming out of the uh, differential process for uh, FARC dissident and criminal groups, and we're doing work on reintegration and reincorporation, but the data I'm presenting is community data on their perceptions and experiences with armed groups in response to these two crises. So, moving on to climate change and climate change-driven recruitment in Colombia. So in Colombia, um, more than 80% of the communities that you can see sort of where we've run these surveys, more than 80% of people that responded to our surveys um, said they had experienced climate change effects, whether it's changes in rainfall, temperature, extreme weather uh, events. And this has had pretty si significant impacts on livelihoods. So of those who acknowledged climate change effects, 79% knew someone whose livelihoods had been negatively affected. Of those, 13% knew someone who had joined an armed group as a result. In Colombia, it's not just climate change, it's also environmental degradation. Um, and this is felt also very widely, we can see in the data, but particularly in rural areas. So this is illegal logging, illegal mining, um, or sometimes semi-legal logging that's happening, but with armed group involvement. Um, and of communities that were affected, uh, 30%, for instance, said that they had noticed changes in deforestation in their own community. So the, the numbers are pretty, pretty significant. 
And this environmental degradation is important because not only does it actually impact uh, and potentially exacerbate climate change, um, but it also renders the population vulnerable to its effects, and it's completely intertwined with conflict dynamics in Colombia. Um, so, you know, for instance, several armed groups that are still active are logging for profit, or they're incentivizing deforestation to help allow the transport of illegal goods. And so this is really integrating. We're also seeing people whose communities were impacted by mining or deforestation um, struggling to make a livelihood, and that themselves could help start, spark um, whether it's resources over water, but also sort of the dynamics of recruitment that armed groups can, can take advantage of. If we turn now to Lake Chad, um, climate change impacts are even more widely felt. So across four different surveys across four countries, 60 to 80 percent of respondents were noting specific climate change effects. And there's been a lot of reporting of late, particularly in the northwest of Nigeria, about the potential for armed groups to exploit uh, conflicts over water and other related uh, uh, attention points to try to expand their influence. We think we have some of the first data, particularly in this case study, that directly links climate change effects to armed group recruitment. So I'm happy to share that with you right now. So this is based on our community leader survey. 85% of community leaders said they know people who are struggling because of uh, climate change effects that they answered previous questions on to make a living because of those changes. 37% of, of those people say that they know someone who joined Boko Haram or a similar group because of those challenges. But it's not just kind of rebel insurgent or listed groups, um, but also self-defense forces or uh, volunteer security outfits that we are also seeing recruitment driven into. If you look in Chad, Niger, and Cameroon, you see, again, similar effects uh, of people who are being impacted. And of those being impacted, do you know someone who joined because of these difficulties? These numbers are pretty significant, but these are people in the community who are saying this about others. What about when you ask ex-combatants themselves? The numbers are pretty similar. So in Chad, Niger, and Cameroon, we see ex-combatants, when they are asked um, if they've experienced these challenges and whether those challenges were one of the reasons that they joined the armed group, pretty significant percentages are saying yes. And what's really notable about these numbers, I mean, 53% of our, our sample in Niger, is how many people in our sample tell us they were coerced and don't admit any agency in getting involved in the first place. So that suggests this problem is actually um, even more significant. So generally in this space, I don't think we're seeing a lot of rebel governance going on. We can't really tell if it's a push or a pull or both that's leading to this recruitment pattern. Um, but at least in Colombia, you do see, not in sort of the classic way of armed actors taking, uh, of governing sort of for a public purpose, but they are regulating for sort of private purposes. So we see that kind of uh, behavior. Where we see something a little bit different is when we, we shift to looking at COVID-19. Um, so we were already collecting data when uh, in this region you had Boko Haram very specifically, at least in its messages, respond to the pandemic. And we saw armed groups doing this all over the world, whether it's white supremacists who were trying to, uh, to weaponize COVID, uh, cartels in Latin America giving out goods and PPE, or the Taliban, some of you probably saw their press conference um, and their hand sanitizer campaign. So we had these groups responding in this way. And in Nigeria, um, Shikau, who was the leader, who formerly was the leader of one of the largest Boko Haram factions, issues this tape on the heels of some of the largest attacks that they have ever conducted at the very beginning of the pandemic in April 2020. Um, and the messages of this tape are that the origins of the, of the virus um, uh, are an attack from Western nations. This is a war on Islam. Alternatively, it's also a punishment from God. Uh, but the followers of the group are immune to the virus. And then there's one specific critique of the government response, which is there had prohibited uh, group pair because of, uh, of social distancing restrictions. And so he calls on people returning to pray shoulder to shoulder. So we wanted to know what the impact of this was. And just to say, uh, luckily, it was relatively minor. So 
We were really worried this would enhance uh, vaccine hesitancy and create issues for the response, but it didn't necessarily do that. The only place we saw a change for those who admitted hearing the message, which were not that many people, um, hearing the message didn't actually have a huge effect, but hearing and trusting the message did shift opinions in sort of two spaces. So those were two messages that the government essentially wasn't talking about. So one was immunity. It just wasn't something that was part of sort of the public health uh, messaging campaign. And then the other one was the origins of the virus. And so those are two things where we do see differences in how the population was responding, but we didn't see uh, an increase in, in hesitancy to sort of admit the reality of, of, the, of the virus or to take the vaccine. And that's probably because there had been such a long running polio vaccine campaign. And it makes sense because we did see a slight shift in youth who weren't around for that campaign. Um, and so may not have that sort of historical memory. Again, not a lot of governance happening, but certainly sort of an, an opportunity to critique, uh, critique the state. We see something slightly different in Colombia. Um, so in some ways you see a similar reaction to Boko Haram. So initially, you see this decline like we do all over the world in the first like month or two of the pandemic, a decline in violence, um, and then you see a real increase and actually surpasses pre-pandemic levels. And so it's hard to read this, but what you can see here is the blue line is monthly caseloads of COVID and um, the orange line is uh, conflict inf incidents. And so they are tracking together. So we see that's kind of a similar reaction. But in a different way, we also see um, what's happening in Colombia somewhat differently. So there's not a message that's critiquing the government. In fact, all the messages are reinforcing. They're the same as the government's. People should be washing their hands. They should be social distancing. And actually, the messages didn't really um, seem to permeate the population very much. But the population was extremely aware of the actions that armed groups were taking as a result and the restrictive measures they were putting in place to essentially enforce the government's um, public health policies. So they started using violence and coercion to restrict. These are active armed groups, FARC dissident groups, criminal groups, uh, and we can't necessarily distinguish amongst all of them. Um, so they started restricting movements, setting up uh, sort of roadblocks into communities, limits on gathering, uh, and pro prohibiting outsiders from visiting. But they also started issuing punishments. So there were reports of, of killing people who were COVID positive, um, enga engaging in sort of property damage, burning motorcycles, threats um, for those who weren't following their guidelines and issuing fines as well. So um, the other thing that we see, and again, this is more along the lines of sort of taking advantage of the pandemic, is that we notice this sort of increase, and this is also in the media as well, about how armed groups had taken the opportunity with COVID to start targeting social leaders that they had already had an issue with. Um, so we see that. So our, our team, we have local teams in each area where we do this work. So our local team in Colombia um, believes through some of their qualitative work that they've done that the reason that the armed groups were responding this way was not only to sort of enhance their legitimacy, particularly from the idea that they would be seen as protecting the local population, but also to usurp the state and to perform state functions um, to show that they could. They were also mostly operating in areas where the state is weak and the, the predominant sort of state institution is the military, which may not be as well suited to running public health um, provisions in some cases. But there's also indications that a lot of this was done for self-preservation. There apparently was quite a concern within groups that they themselves would be impacted by COVID and that would operationally um, weaken them. So they didn't want that to happen. So at least initially, they really tried to restrict, um, restrict movement really to save themselves. So I have rushed through a lot in like a really, really quick period of time. There's so much more to say, and, and we have a lot of other stuff that is also more directly on this topic. So just to say, um, I'd, I'd like to thank you. I'd love to continue the conversation. I left my email up there, so feel free to reach out, and I can explain more about what we're doing, and we can see if it overlaps with what you're doing. But just to say, you know, we've also been collecting particularly um, in every, everywhere we work, but particularly in the Lake Chad Basin, information on uh, what Boko Haram did when they occupied communities. So we, we have a whole list of services we ask about. Um, we ask about whether they ran courts. The percentages of respondents who say they did run courts in the Difa region of Niger is extremely high. I think it's 77%, um, much lower Chad and uh, Chad in Cameroon. But what's interesting is when you ask people what sort of services or, or functions they perform, when you ask if they did dispute resolution, it's almost zero. 
So they're operating courts, but people aren't seeing them as, as uh, resolving disputes. So that's a super interesting thing that I think we have to explore a bit more. Thanks so much.